time for some R&R This is for the readers and the real folk This is for the readers and the real folk This is for the readers and the real folk Living from coast to coast This is for the people This is for the readers and the real folk This is for the readers and the real folk This is for the readers and the real folk Living from coast to coast This is for the people It's time for some r and Welcome, 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 my readers and real folk. I am your host, Manda Raquel Webb. Books, art, film, music, all together in one spot, celebrating us right here, right now, every week. It's all art, and it's all good. That's who we are, and that's what we do. It's time for some R&R. &R. Let's roll. This week on Readers and Real Folk, we talk Black Lit with Mahogany Books. We cover the timely art of resistance with Black Art in America's Najee Dorsey. And DJ Haas does another hostile takeover of Baltimore artist producer John Tyler as he creates sounds from scratch. But before we jump into the show, it's Art from the Starts, where we showcase an artist's work available at blackartinamerica.com, the leading online portal for African-American art in the nation. This week's image is Toni Morrison, The Moon and Sun, by rising star Delita Martin, a highly sought after artist by seasoned collectors and museums alike. Martin's recent show, Delita Martin, Calling Down the Spirits, opened the exhibition season at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in January 2020. Martin also graced Black Art in America's list of the 10 breakthrough women artists as polled by Black-owned art galleries. And yes, you can have this treasure hanging on your wall. And remember, when you buy fine art, from emerging and established artists at blackartinamerica.com, you can use our special Readers and Real Folk Value Code, which is R plus R5, at checkout for 5% off premier works by Black American artists. That's right, it pays to hang out with Readers and Real Folk. Mahogany Books is an award-winning independent bookstore specializing in books written for, by, or about people of the African diaspora. Created online in 2007 by DC-based husband and wife duo Derek and Ramonda Lark Young, 10 years later, the couple also opened a physical location in the Ward 8 Anacostia community of Washington, DC. Mahogany Books, named after their daughter, is the result of Derek and Ramonda's love for culture, community, and literature, and their desire to see it empower others as it has empowered them. In 2019, Mahogany Books was named one of the top 100 minority business enterprises, and they have been featured nationally in the Washington Post, Black Enterprise, Vanity Fair, Forbes, Oprah Magazine, highlighting their commitment to making books accessible. Mahogany Books with Ramonda Lark Young and Derek Young. Welcome to Readers and Real Folk. Hey, hey. <laughs> hey, all right. Party. How y'all doing? We are doing fantastic, all things considered. Life is different, but life is good. The amen. It, it is different. And, you know, we can silver line it, right? Tell, yeah. what, tell our readers a real folk reminder who's in the background. And what's Absolutely. Who is in the background is my uh -huh. sexy husband and our daughter's back over there, Mahogany. Oh, um, good to see her. We are the owners, co-founders of Mahogany Books, which has been in business now, wow, 13 years. So, yeah, we're actually live in, in our store just to let uh, viewers know that we're answering the phones. We're actually in the midst of curbside pickups. So that's why hubby's back and forth. 
there. We really want to make sure that we are, are here for our customers too and making those books accessible. Mahogany Books is a bookstore that specializes in books that are written for, by, and about people of the African diaspora. So essentially black books. It was always something for us to really connect with our community, really connect with our culture, and to be able to, to merge those two has been something that's a passion of ours. But we started online, like I said, about 10 or 11 years ago. And the whole premise was, how do we create um, a business that could not only just service the people here in DC, but also service people internationally. So all across the United States, people can order from us, people can um, participate with us online and a lot of different things. So yeah, we're excited about that. Yeah, I feel like you all are uniquely positioned to uh, thrive a little more than some of the other small businesses mm -hmm. out here because you did start online. But before we talk about that, so where did the name Mahogany Books come from? Ah, absolutely. So Mahogany Books, we have a daughter named Mahogany. Essentially the name really evokes in my mind something very strong, something very beautiful, something very rich. And when we think of our culture and we think of our community, those are the same terms uh, that come to mind as well. Rich, strong, bold, um, confident. If you can see the logo back there, you see these little puffs sticking up, um, holding a book. And um, we were at a bookstore and she, we, I took a photo of her and she was holding a book. And that same image is what we recreated into, um, into our logo. So yeah, she's kind of infused all throughout our business. So in the name and in the image that's back there too. I love it. And I can imagine, uh, was it, you know, we all know Kwame Alexander. And Kwame grew up and his father was surrounded by books. So I can only imagine a mahogany being able to kind of see you and your husband grow your business and, and what kind of impact has it had on her? So yes, um, she actually had a business. She still has a business and she started hers when she was seven. And I'll be honest, I think a lot of it started because we would be out, you know, at that time we didn't have a physical space, but we'd be out in the community um, at book events or working with authors and having our table set up full of books so customers can come up and buy and get them autographed. And she would see that for years and, and we would incorporate her in that process too. She'd ring the register and we'd make it fun so she'd think it was math and practice giving people change. So just in making her really be a part of this journey. And so her seeing that, I believe, at a young age really prompted her to start her own business. And she would ask me over and over, Mommy, I want to start my own business over and over. So I, we sat down and came up with a name for her business and ordered her business cards. And the next time we actually had a book signing, she had her merchandise on the side of ours at her own table with her shirt on and her business cards and her tote bag. And so for her being an entrepreneur, I think really stemmed from what she saw from us and being a part of seeing what Mommy and Daddy does. And even to this day, she has products in our store. She has candles. She's so um, handmade scarves that she's um, done personally. Even her giving us ideas in, in our store and looking at profit margins and, and cost of things and inventory. It's a trip to me to see this young teenager be that involved and that connected to the business. Tell us about some of the pitfalls that arise or have arisen from you know, being a small business. Talk to the readers and real folk about some, some of those challenges and how you overcame them. I think the, one of the biggest thing that always sticks out to me is back in, I guess it's been about 13 years since our business opened. So back during that time, of course, it was a recession, 2008, 2007 at that time. Um, but for us, it was still something that was in our spirit to open up a bookstore, right? So opening up a bookstore back then um, was unheard of. And I say that because in that same landscape, there were stores closing left and right. And also in that space, there was eBooks. So to say, we wanted to open up a physical store in that time. A lot of people who were luminaries, people who were dear peers of ours were saying, no, don't open it. And so I really want your listeners to realize and to think about what that, that headspace that can put you in. When you have something that God has planted in your spirit to execute on, and yet everybody around you, even the economy looks like it's crazy, like I said, because it was going into that deep uh, recession space, is saying, no, 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 don't do it. This is not the time for you. And so for us, we kind of had to block some of those, those noises out. And I, I often tell people we had to turn up our own voice and mute all the naysayers, right? People that are there who may not have seen the vision that we saw, people who were not in the community, seeing and interacting with the people that we were seeing that were saying, when are you guys going to open up a store? When, when, when? So yes, even though it looks like it's bleak around us, we had to remain stead steadfast in what we believe. Of course, financing, we did not have money to start a full-fledged bookstore. Uh, we bootstrapped it all the way, pulled from our 401k at that point. 
Um, so we're, you know, now impacting our retirement. We did not take out loans from any bank. We talked to friends and they donated to us. And so again, just, I mean, when I say tunnel vision, really staying focused on what that, that vision and that, that goal was for us. But it was hard and still here, still learning, still growing in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I'm still staying steadfast to that vision of making black books accessible. I love it. I wanted to learn more about uh, Mahogany Front Row. Mahogany Books Front Row um, right now is, there's a lot of people during this space that we're in now where the online space is crowded. Everybody's hosting a virtual this, virtual that. And so Mahogany Books Front Row was kind of our way of weeding through everything and kind of branding that, branding that, that experience for um, our customers. And so Front Row really alludes to them having the opportunity to sit right in the comfort of their own home, in front of their computer, and have the best seat in the house. And that best seat in the house allows them to be part of just very engaging conversations through chat, right? So they show up and, and put their questions right there in the comments, and I'll read them live um, for the author to, to, to answer. And so it's been great um, to have people show up. There's not a lot of uh, Black bookstores or bookstores that are really making sure the Black authors and the black voice um, voices are heard and so it's exciting for us to be in that space uh, we just hosted Kimberla Lawson Roby last night she was amazing um, Elizabeth Acevedo who is winning awards all left and right um, fresh voice African uh, Afro Dominicana um, just amazing young adult writer and we did her clap when you land book and coming up is Ed Gordon famed journalist um, so a lot of great people are saying hey let's pause let's go see about mahogany books over here and make sure that we engage that audience and be part of Mahogany Books front row. So it's exciting. So how important is it to have a bookstore with books by, for, and about people of color? It's crucial from a lot of different angles. Um, there have been so many studies that show that people who can connect from young readers up to adults, people who can connect with their ethnic group when they read, it impacts two crucial areas, self-confidence and self-esteem. We're talking about just from books, that have your story, have your face, have your, your voice reflected in it, self-confidence and self-esteem. And so we have a, a bookstore full of books that really um, confirm and affirm who we are as black people. And so that's very important to us. When you look at illiteracy rates in our communities, it's crazy. And a lot of times kids are not connected to books because there's no, no real way where they feel like their voice is heard, their, 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 their story is heard, their legacy is heard in those books. And so it impacts them, it impacts their desire to read, it impacts their desire to show up in school and be their best selves a lot of times. And so to have a store here in the community that has those type of books accessible is important to us. So remember Derek was telling me a story of a gentleman who came in, an older man, he came to our store here in the Anacostia Art Center. And he was walking in and he came to the threshold and he stopped at the threshold of our bookstore and he paused and he just looked around, just slowly looked around at all the books and he started tearing up mm. and Derek walked over to him and said, sir, you know, what's going on? Is everything okay? He said, I've never in my life seen this many black books. And he was an older gentleman. I mean, to tear up, you know, I, tear, I, I hope I don't tear up on this interview. I always tear up because it's something so bigger than us. It is something so much more serious than us. And to see a man who's lived his life, we don't know his journey, his story, but yet to see himself, reflected in fiction, in nonfiction, in health, in architecture, in business, all of those books that now have our story, our slice and point of view in them is, is crucial. And it's crucial to us as a people to walk and stand tall and knowing that we have put our fingerprint on all those different genres, all those different pieces of what is a part of the American fabric, not just the black fabric, but the American fabric. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a big thing. Hey everybody, it's Najee Dorsey, and you're with Naj now. Tell us about Gullah Jack, the inspiration behind it. So Gullah Jack, uh, Gullah Jack is a continuum of my resistance series. And in 2011, I started a body of work of men and women who were the unsung heroes and sheroes, people who fought, you know, for their own, you know, 
human rights, really, you know, it wasn't even civil rights, it's human rights, the right to live. So much of what we're taught, at least what I was taught coming up, what we hear about uh, the Harriets and we hear about, you know, Malcolm and Martin and, um, but we don't really hear about the people who fought back, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the countless communities that got tired of the, uh, being oppressed and being violated and, you know, just being destroyed. And they just like, they, they fall back. And so Gullah Jack is continuing that series. When I found out about, you know, heard about Denmark VC and then heard about Gullah Jack and Gullah Jack was his right hand. I'm like, yo, you know, a lot of people know about the primary of a given movement, but never really about, you know, the other people that were important to, you know, the struggle and, and, and uh, and what you know, what was um, and what they were doing, and so Gullah Jack being a priestess, a mojo conjurer, you know, just uh, African born and slave, you know, he was thought to be, you know, thought to be invincible, you know, that he had magical powers, and he he would use those powers and talked about how uh, you know God was with us for the fight for freedom, you know, and so like that was appealing to me to be able to use my creative energy to to give visual representation to that story. Um, and so I did a series uh, entitled Gullah Jack. You know, I had hoped to do more. I think I ended up with five, five, six pieces in the series, but at least, you know, at least it's done, you know, and, you know, that story's out there. So, yeah, Gullah Jack, look them up. To be honest with you, I don't know how it happened. <laughs> I don't know how it happened. You know, I would get a piece here, I'd be at a flea market here, I'd be at a show here and a show there. Then I would buy a, a little piece and then I said, oh, I like this person. Maybe I'll see him next year. I never realized that I had the amount of stuff that I had until other people came into my house. You know, I travel, I would bring back a piece. I'm always traveling and bringing back pieces and um, at a lot of markets, the flea markets, my art comes from all over. I buy what I like and not necessarily the name. My collection is a little of everything. It's embracing it's very embracing it's most of it is a little quiet it's about everyday living um, people working families um, lovers um, but it's everyday living people doing positive things um, is what you see in most of my art. I didn't think I was a collector. I was probably thinking like a lot of other people, oh yeah, to collect art, you have to have a piece that's worth probably $100,000 or $20,000. You know, I said, well, you know, I just have all my little stuff. And unbeknownst to me, somebody came and said, oh, you have so much stuff. You are a collector. And I still didn't consider myself a collector. I just had lots of stuff. I realized that there's so many gifted artists right here, right under my own nose, that I don't have to go far. And out of all the different artists, these are the people that I want to bring into my house, the people from my neighborhood, because they're really the, it's really the art I'm looking for, and why not support them? There is a piece that I absolutely love, and I call it my centerpiece. And the girl that did it, her name is Joanne Tang. And it looks like abstract. It is abstract, but if you look closer at it, she's put people in the images and she calls it 
hiding from the establishment. I absolutely love it. I come home and that's exactly how I feel. When I come home from work and click that door, I'm like out of here, hiding from the establishment. Hiding from the establishment is probably the centerpiece of my collection. When I come home, I said, hey y'all, I'm home. Click, you know, and it's like just me and my stuff, my art and my books. And you know, and I can stand all weekend. I have everything I want right here. That's right, my readers and real folk. This is a hostile takeover. So strap up for a ride on the r, r Express with your main man, DJ Haas. But special shout out to my web queen, Monda Raquel Webb, and also to blackartinamerica.com, the only place to get that quality black art. Check it. We're gonna take a hostile ride back over to the B-more, Baltimore, Maryland, to check in on our musical friend, artist producer, John Tyler. Tyler's show is Sounds from Scratch, and this time around, Tyler create from scratch in the studio while b -more's Juba Productions catches the whole thing on film. So check it. Here it is, straight out of b -more, Sounds from Scratch. singer, producer, engineer, mason engineer, does it all, you already know. You can check out his album that just released, From Grace, Full Grace, and I'll stream it on all platforms. YTK, welcome to the room. Thanks for being here. Honestly, I feel like, I feel like something with, um, it gotta have bounce. That's all. You gotta, I'm, I'm on some bounce. Something I, I don't know. It's like beautiful and bouncy. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Should go, shouldn't I? But I suppose we could grow. I could revolutionize STPD. You got me missing you and I. How you be when with me? It's a different type of vibe. Most time I be tired, but you see a different side. Double tap on the screen like IG. You so live when we kick like the lie. Make you sing though T lie. And she ride like a lime. She the main little course. Ain't no need for a side. That's beside the point. When I'm with you, I feel high. You the flyest joint. And I've been the type. Niggas say it's overrated, but you got. Got me way past infatuated 
Infatuated Bros think a nigga exaggerating To the point a nigga getting a little aggravated Cause I'm past the point of infatuated Infatuated Exaggerating Nigga like me wants stay ten toes, sneak on the beat, tiptoe, go pro, tick tap my black, we pulled out phones, man, no way, pop, they saw real pros, 20 been crazy, that's how it goes, but look at baby, but if I doze, I'm on your head, but under your nose, you said I was phony, but what do you know, took a ass show, I ain't flexing, I'm just showing the growth, if I'm doing me, what you doing the most, so it's kinda natural, like going to go, so I'm back from LA, say hello to my folks, and pick up my clothes, but leaving my coats, cause shit getting cold, shit getting crazy, niggas gonna shake this shit like, hey, ah, I think, I think I need another one. Well, that does it for this week's edition of Readers and Real Folk. Remember, join us here each week at blackartinamerica.com for new episodes. And stay tuned for next week when r and sits down for an exclusive interview with iconic Tony Award winning Broadway film and TV director, Kitty Leon. And don't forget to type in the R plus RFI value code for the 5% off at checkout when you shop for fine art at blackartinamerica.com. Until next time, this is your r and host, Monda Raquel Webb, wishing you art, peace, and love. This is for the readers and the real folk Living from coast to coast This is for the people This is for the readers and the real folk Ooh. This is for the readers and the real folk yeah. This is for the readers and the real folk Living from coast to coast This is for the people This is for my people, yeah This is for the people This is for my people, yeah It's time for some R&R &R.